right. Let's see. All right, we're live. All right, so I am beyond excited for this one. This is, it's kind of just everything coming full circle for me. I could not be more proud to introduce the man, the myth, the legend, Larry Dixon. For those of you guys who don't know Larry, you absolutely should. Larry uh, is a local product. He was a local high school football star um, out here. He went to Olympic High School, my alma mater, and just tore things up. To give you an idea of how much he tore things up, I'm actually going to share my screen. And I just, I want you guys to see this. Look at this photo. Look at this photo of this man right here. He was a man among boys when he played football. No doubt. That stiff arm is something that Marshawn Lynch will be proud of. But if you guys are also taking a look at the photo, you see him in uniform. He actually got a high school uh, scholarship from Olympic High School to West Point. He played for Army where he was a captain senior year. And you can see Larry there graduating. Um, and after that, he decided he was going to uh, take those things that he learned on the field, uh, off the field to the world of financial planning and tax accounting. So he is here. He is my guest. Uh, he's also agreed to come on for the next few weeks and share some very, very timely information. Uh, today, we're going to focus mainly on some of the tax benefits for purchasing and refinancing a home, uh, as well as dive a little bit into the CARES Act and uh, a couple of potential solutions for that. So with all of that being said, he's now over at Atlas and or Atlas Tax Accounting Solutions. Uh, just a word of the wise, if you like the information that's here, he can actually help anyone across the nation uh, with majority of their taxes uh, and taking advantage of these. He's really been specializing and pinpointing into the world of real estate and uh, business taxes. And without further ado, Larry, thank you for joining me today, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, always a good time to come out and talk about taxes. I know, man. Well, let's let's first just get into the the my passion too, the football side of things. Man, you were a captain over at West Point. Yeah, that's a place that just does nothing but breed leaders. I mean, guys who just know what it's like to have a great work ethic, team. And you stood out there. You broke a few records over there. I mean, you were the guy. One of them. It, it, it was a good time. I uh, met a lot of good guys. met a lot of good players. I mean, it was possibly the most fun I've had in my entire life up to this point. I mean, and I still talk to a lot of those guys today. Most of them are all my best friends. So, yeah, it was, it was a time. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, real estate. Why the move over to doing – or why the move over to doing – um, taxes for a focus of or towards real estate when I well I just I like taxes I love them and then when I jumped in I was like I'm just gonna learn everything by but the it, way that is the first person to ever have a conversation with me and said they love taxes period you need one in your group everyone needs a person around who loves taxes and then when you jump in everyone's noticed it like it's confusing and then there's just a lot of it right like this last cares act I was like oh, I'm just gonna read the whole bill it was 864 pages so then I like one of my first mentors was just like, you have to choose something and you have to start focusing on that. And I've been Absolutely. fascinated with real estate for such a long time. I just, I, it's fascinating. It's fun. And a lot of the people that I talked to on the football team, they gravitated towards it too. And so, you know, you learn more about it, you get kind of good. And then I just realized that I was spending time just hanging out in my free time. I was like, well, if I can combine what I want to do with my life with what I do in my free time, we're going to be in a good place. So I just kind of backed it into real estate. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, that's really what it boils down to is you just found a way to connect your passion and what you were doing um, and then take it into something. I mean, what a lot of people don't know about you is, I mean, man, I've known you since Jesus. I have no clue. I mean, you were a little guy. If you ever were a little guy, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I've known you since you were in high school, since you were in junior high. And, you know, not a lot of people knew that you were just a whiz when it came to numbers and so for you to take that and now go this direction, uh, it's, it's just such an awesome story to watch a local product go out 
there, do his thing on the national level, and now just find a way to connect all of his passions together. And, and that's pretty much what it's about. Like, you know, you play football. I played football since really seventh grade up until my senior year of college. And then after I was done and like the NFL wasn't going to work out, I was just kind of like, well, what do I do now? And like military is a great place to be at because you get to lead, you get to be in that environment where you get to do physical things all day. And I was just like, you know, you feel the aches and pains in your body. You realize you can't do this forever. And then you just kind of backdoor to something where I get to spend time with numbers and then learn something new every day. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, that's, that's really the thing is you are just finding ways to excel. So let's jump into some of the topics. You know, I have so many clients that come to me and of course, not being a tax professional, I can't ask them or I can't give them tax advice. So the next best thing is having you here available for my clients, for my friends, because uh, that's the whole purpose of what I'm doing with these. I, I just virtually want to connect my community there. And when I get asked the question, what are the tax benefits to owning or refinancing a home? Do you think you could hit a couple of those bullet points for me? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I got PowerPoint right here. And I guess the biggest thing. Yeah, pull up the screen. All you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the biggest thing to know about, like, just when you get into real estate and taxes, the biggest thing to understand is that when you buy a house, and you're ever trying to make money, you play offense. And then if you ever talk about taxes, we're talking about defense. So really, it's what can we do to protect the money we're making? And I think real estate personally is one of the best ways to do that. So obviously this is my firm. Um, and again, like I said, it's it, owning a home is the biggest, or in my opinion, the best way to start building that wealth across. And it's one of the asset groups that I think everyone should try to participate in. And then this is one of the quotes that I found in high school from John Paulson. Obviously everyone knows who that is. And he said, if you don't buy, if you don't own a home, buy one. If you don't own a home, buy another. If you own two homes, buy a third and lend your relatives the money to buy a home. Again, this is just people at a high level doing high things, all agreeing that real estate is the way to go. And these are the pros that you kind of hear. And again, when we talk offensive, these are the benefits that you get up front. So you get the passive income, especially when you become a renter. And you talk about appreciation in your, in, your, in your property. You have the growth potential in your property, stability, predictability in the increases. They've increased over time, just a steady climb up. And then obviously the appreciation, we can only say that so many times. So the big tax benefits that you get, it's at three different points. You're really at three different points whenever you talk about real estate. You're either buying real estate or in the market to try to buy real estate. You either own the real estate because you already bought it or you're trying to sell, right? And at all the three levels, you get different kind of benefits. So at the buy, you get in the, the chance to write off different fees, right? So you have the seller fees, the buyer fees, um, the real estate agent fees, and any points that you try to buy back. And I'm sure you'll dig into points or you have already dug enough points, but basically it's the interest that you buy up front so that you don't have to pay it throughout the duration of the loan, which is the simplest way to do that. And then you can write that off in that year. And then you have the insurance premiums and interest and property taxes while you own it. And Everybody so let's... Let's unpack this kind of like one by one. Oh, let's do it. Uh, yeah, let's, let's take this off. I'm trying to figure out a way that I can, can you unshare the screen real quick? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all right, so let's unpack it. So when somebody is on, on your slide, when you talk about um, the points and the fees and things like that, uh, that's really the first part. So if you're talking about the actual transaction of real estate, if you're talking about you are either purchasing a home for the first, or you're either purchasing a home or you're refinancing a home. Well, it's about the, the loan fees that are associated with that. Now, they get tax write-offs from that, correct? Absolutely. So anytime anyone buys anything, just start from the basics. You go buy a piece of gum, you're going to have fees, which is going to be a sales tax, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's the same way. So there's things that surround it. You have the different points, the fees that you talked about. And whenever you buy real estate, it's your first real opportunity if you don't own a business to take those and then have those benefit you on your tax return. So every dollar that you spend is a direct one for one deduction from your adjusted gross income on the year. Now that's different from a lot okay. of things because again, it's not going to benefit you as you get a chance to participate in this valuable asset. Got it. Got it. Okay. So are, are there any key things? Cause I know, you know, with the, uh, with when you're supposed to file your taxes, that being that deadline now being extended. If somebody is buying a home or refinancing a home this year, are there any key line items or things that they should look at to where they should be like, you know, aha, <laughs> this is a write-off. This is something I got to make sure I do. Or like, your mark. What do you think? The important thing is people miss 
the things that go into purchasing. So I constantly have people come to me at the end of the year, they bought a house. I'm like, okay, cool. Send me your 1098. And they think that 1098 is the item that's going to, it's the document that the bank's going to give you. And they think it's going to have everything on there. Yeah. Constantly, what you'll see on the 1098 is that when banks sell the mortgage to different people, they miss different kinds of fees. So you always want to concentrate on who's paying the realtor because those realtors are always going to be deductions. The fees that you go, the fees that go into, or yeah, any fees or points that you buy back or anything that goes into you acquiring the loan, all things that you want to have receded and detailed because it's either going to add to the value of your home for when you sell it, or again, it's going to be written off in that direct year. Now, of course, everybody's situation is going to be different, but I mean, if you're looking at it, sometimes uh, I've been told by different tax professionals, you can take all of those discount points or what it takes to buy an interest rate down lower. You can take that all in one lump sum, or you could amortize it out just depending on if it's an owner occupied property or if it's an investment property or just whatever. Correct. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's the real key where you want to sit down. And I always like to have people to have conversations whenever your tax situation changes your life, you want to discuss it with a tax professional. Cause again, like you said, it can be written off amortized across the entire loan. So added in over the entire cost loan over the 30 years, or it can be taken in that year. And if you don't talk to a tax professional, if you're not trying to seek out the answers early, you could miss it. And then again, those could be potentially five to $10,000 misses that you could miss, whether it's over the lifetime of the loan or it's just in that year. Yeah. And we got a great question that's coming in from, uh, I believe it's Carisha Stanley, I believe. Uh, She's just saying, how can I ensure I have a complete list of fees tied to a home purchase or possibly a refinance? I'll just ad lib that a little bit. No, hundred percent. And the How best way to do make it, sure. Uh, talk to your, it's always talk to your. You're really going to operate with your your loan officer, which, as you know, is going to work with the mortgage company. You're going to operate with the real estate agent. It's having those constant interactions, and it's always pestering them for those kind of fees. You'll get a 1099s or your breakdown of what this yeah. went into the sale. But every time you have a conversation, every time you add something in always pull that in and re- writing because once it's in writing that's a receipt for you and that's going to be the documentation forward so right and i can even add a little bit to that um what you usually or what you get at the end of every home loan transaction is something okay. called a closing disclosure now you're going to get those maybe one maybe two times um but that should have every single fee uh listed out at least from the buyer or the person who's refinancing their side. Uh, You can have that version. So once you get the closing disclosure, I would definitely keep a copy for tax purposes. Uh, If for whatever reason you misplace it because you're moving or something along those lines, the title and escrow company uh, that you closed at should have a record of that uh, with inside of their system so they can get it for you. So if you closed your home loan at uh, fidelity title, attorney's title, Pacific Northwest title, Chicago title, CW title, any of those first American, they will typically have something saved in the system, or you can go back and have communication, uh, with your loan officer, whoever helped you on that. Uh, if you are selling the home, uh, typically again, the title and escrow company should have that for you or your real estate agent who assisted you with the sale of your home. All right, so let's jump back into your PowerPoint, my man. Uh, Let's take a look at, uh, uh, I know you had the second box there, so while you own. Yeah, and then basically while you own, there's three things that most people hit, two things that that you'll definitely get hit with if you have a mortgage, and then three things if you buy at certain levels. So the mortgage insurance premiums are things that you pay on a loan, if you have less than 20% when you purchase it, right? So you'll see uh, mortgage insurance premiums up front, and then the interest that you pay on the loan is all deductible, as well as the property taxes that you pay on the home in the county. And that's all dependent on where you live, and that's another thing to get with your tax assessor, another form that comes in once you buy the home. Awesome, awesome. So when you're talking about the mortgage insurance premium, uh, there's a a couple of different... uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can uh, break that down. All right, so let's take a look here. I'm gonna do this. Uh, sorry, sharing. Uh, 
All right. So when you are doing something along the lines of the mortgage insurance premium, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, the like homeowners insurance premium. Is that correct? No, it's the uh, what right. the banks. Yeah, it's what the banks. It's what you pay the banks to insure your loan. Okay, so, I, so there's different ways. So you have PMI, yeah. and sometimes they have you pay that up front. That's yep. a mortgage insurance premium or yep. PMI. Uh, I know on like VA home loans, it's 2.15%. They ask for you to have that up front um, and financed into the loan. And then they have uh, private mortgage insurance if it's a conventional loan or FHA does some similar stuff. Uh, is, is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about like their Allstate or... PEMCO or State Farm Policy? That's a great question. So the PMI is what I was specifically referring to. Perfect. And that's what's going to be carried on as the insurance against your loan. And you'll see that carried on if you have less than 20%. If you're working with the VA, you'll typically hear, hear that called a funding fee, a VA funding fee. Yes. And that yes. is going to be written off at, in the year that you buy the home. And or if you have an FHA loan, it's known as a UFMIP or Upfront Mortgage Insurance Premium. So, I mean, sometimes the terminologies can be put over your head, but just know if there's a fee that is associated with you using or obtaining a home loan, then you should be asking that question. Mm -hmm. You know, can I deduct it from my taxes? Correct? Absolutely. And, that, and that's the important thing here. And that's the big thing about real estate is that first time where when you're paying money out, you can have a very intelligent, deliberate conversation with your tax professional on, hey, like, how can I get this money back? And in a lot of cases, real estate, you can't. And I want you to know, I mean, I have recommended time and time again, if you are owning or refinancing a home, uh, definitely, or if you have purchased or are refinancing home in that year, I mean, it, it is so critical that you seek out a tax professional. This That wouldn't be the time that I would use the TurboTax or something online, I would definitely talk to a tax professional because there's a lot of things that are on the table. I mean, you got to think about most of the stuff you're doing when you're purchasing a home. Typically right now in today's market, a lot are still first time home buyers, or if they aren't first time home buyers, maybe they've also sold a home in that same year or are renting it out for the first time. So you want to look for those different tax advantages. If uh -huh. you are refinancing, you got to remember what is what typically comes along with when you refinance a home. Well, you're either doing debt consolidation, okay, or mm -hmm. you are doing improvements on the home. Yep. You know, and if you're doing improvements on the home, uh, as you'll see in the rest of Larry's slide here, those two can become tax deductions. Correct. And right. and, and that's the big Let's thing. I try to do all the time. If your tax situation changed, you want to. It may not be having them do your return, but you want to take some time to aside some money to get involved with the tax professional. Because again, things change every year and sometimes they change month to month. Like this is a perfect example. Our entire world, the entire scope of the world changed in three months. And so now the entire tax situation for this year and next year, there's different effects and ram ramifications. And by just talking to professionals, you kind of get into the know of those. So I can't recommend that enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's jump back into your slides. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, so again, the last part, and you, you kind of already teed it up really perfectly there is the improvements, right? And then the kind of differs on where if you have someone living in the house versus you're living it there. But again, keeping those detailed receipts on the improvements is really going to affect you when you sell. And it's going to raise that initial cash basis. And obviously, if you own real estate for an extended period of time, two year, two consecutive years, um, you get access to um, what's it called the that exception which allows you to um bypass two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars if you're married and capital gains so again those improvements add into that and then create a little bit more room for you to sell and save some money there so larry uh we got a a question that's coming in from robert fredrickson okay um he actually uh was curious and I'd love to know your thoughts on this as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'd love to know your thoughts on this as well. When it comes to making a down payment on a home, is any of that tax deductible? No. So unfortunately, uh, making your down payment is not a tax deduction. It's okay. generally seen it's just like it's an investment seen as an investment. So the same way if you were to buy a stock, it's not going to be tax deductible for you. 
in that year, but you're entering into a field where you can gain tax deductions. And that's kind of how it should be seen. Now, with that being said, what if you're getting a gift from mom and dad or a relative? Do they get to write that off as a tax? And so that one, because we have to tease that out, right? So the, I think with gifts, you really got to look at it. But the big thing that you see is called a step-up basis. So if someone were to gift you a house, especially after they pass, you get to claim a higher, a higher cost basis. So generally what you see is someone bought a house in the 60s or 70s. They bought a house for $100,000. In Washington, a house bought for $100,000 in the 60s or 70s, probably worth $500,000 to $600,000. If someone were to gift you $600,000, okay. then you would have to pay taxes on that, right? Because the right. government wants right. that. Right. If they give you a real estate piece for $600,000, you now get to claim it in the year you receive it at $600,000. So in the eyes of the IRS and the tax law, you didn't make any money, you didn't receive any money. And so that's the big thing with real estate is that step up basis. Okay, now what if let's say I need $20,000 for a down payment and I don't got it, but mom and dad say, we want to help you uh, with purchasing the home. Here's $20,000 as a down payment. Okay. Yep. And so do, you, do they get to write it off as a gift? Do I get to write it off? <laughs> Does anybody get to write it off? So that it's, it's weird. It's like that money it looks as though it disappeared. So it's everybody gets a gift allowance for every year, right? So right now in this year, it's $15,000. And yeah. then you have a lifetime gift, which is about 3.7, last time I checked. And it goes up every year. And then so basically they wouldn't pay any tax on that, but they would have to do a tax or a gift tax return. And then it would be counted against their lifetime gift tax above 15,000 in a year. And so if you're gonna ever receive a gift, again, talk to a tax professional because there's ways to structure, structure the gift so it won't be counted or affected as in taxes, your tax situation in that year or the following years. Okay. Now I, I mean, you know where we live, man. I mean, yeah, 100%. inside of Kitsap where y- you have like the shipyard, for instance, you know, yeah. uh, you got uh, PSNS and IMF over here. And a, a lot of the guys are taking uh, down payments out of their TSP. That is something yeah. that I see quite frequently. So if they're taking it out of a retirement account, are there major tax ramifications for that? Um, the information that I'm getting is there isn't because they're supplying a purchase and sale contract and it's for the purchase of a primary residence. And that's why you always want to talk to your tax professional. So this is a thing that kind of goes back and forth and they kind of decide. They constantly move in what you can use your tax dollars for and any given, or sorry, your I, your retirement dollars for and any yeah. given. So you'll have your IRAs, your 401ks and your TSPs. So always consult with your tax professional in any given year right now. If you were to move the TSP or money from your TSP to pay for a purchase of a home, it's it's not going to really affect your tax situation. But again, taking that right now and operating in the future, you always want to consult with someone because that's something that changes constantly. Right, right. Okay. Well, then I guess in in line with that, when you're, when you're doing those things, again, you want to keep a copy of the paperwork 100%. so that when it comes tax time and you don't have to have that big tax bill from uncle Sam, uh, you want to make sure that you have that paperwork to give to your tax professional, correct? hundred percent. And that's the big thing. Cause like when we submit a tax form for people, it's Mm -hmm. probably six to 12 pages, right? The 180 pages is basically what's there as a defense. If anybody ever comes and asks questions, a lot of people following along, if you're following along, uh, if you're following along as you're watching this, you want to make sure that come tax time, you have a copy of the 1098, which is the uh, which is the tax form that comes from wherever your bank or your mortgage is being serviced, uh, that has how much interest you paid off, okay? If you did a purchase or a refinance in that year, you want a copy of the closing disclosure, the final closing disclosure. If you misplaced it for whatever reason, you can contact title and escrow typically to get that. And if you withdrew any funds from your 401k or TSP or got a gift from mom and dad, you want the paperwork connected and associated with that. So there's typically a gift letter that you get from your lender when it comes from mom and dad. And then from your 401k or TSP, uh, there's something called the terms of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. That's spot on. Yep. And that's right. And then again, always document it's the dates and what you did on that date is important. Always the date, 
what you did and then what you did with the money that you had, right? Because again, they're going to follow the money. And then just one thing, just as a tax person, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, people need to take the time to develop great systems and track their documentation. Because I'm telling you at the end of the year, there's nothing more heartbreaking when you see an opportunity, but they don't have the documentation to support it. So again, document, document, document. I, I'm sorry, it's a tax person. Man. No, it is, it is, it is. Dropbox people, if you got it, yes. use it. 100%, it 100%. It'll save you money. It'll save you money. All right, man. Well, let's uh, let's get a little bit more into your slides. I know you were talking a little bit about home improvements and things like that. Yep. And like I said, so that's pretty much, that's the thing to understand, right? Is understand at the buy while you own and when you sell, sell you always want to talk to a professional at those points to understand what you can do, right? And so moving on, we're going to go into the CARES Act, right? So March 25th, uh, President Trump signed into office something that completely changed our life, right? The CARES Act. Now, there's really four big things that went into it. There's obviously tons, right? But the four big things that I really took away is the stimulus payment that everyone's going to receive, the PPP and the EIDL loans for the businesses, and then for people with homes, specifically for us on this interview right here, it's forbearance, right? So this is forbearance right here. It's basically allow temporarily allowing you not to pay your mortgage and then at the end, of pausing the payments for a period of time. Right now for us, they said three to six months. So we can kind of dig into that right now and we can kind of get after that and see where that takes us. But that's kind of the big thing for homeowners is that forbearance or that ability to forbear your mortgage for three to six months. Okay, so now I have to, you gave your tax professional. Yep, 100%. Center. I'm going to give mine. Yep. The thing that I've tried to communicate to everybody is we have not seen how TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian are going to respond to this. Uh, the real the real center of it is every servicer is going to handle the forbearance process differently. There wasn't a lot of guidance uh, that was given and it is turning out that the request for this is in record numbers. And the yep. reason why it's in record numbers is because unlike the 2008 mortgage crisis, you do not have to show any evidence of a hardship with this one. You basically sign a form and attest that you are, um, you were affected by the economic impact of COVID-19 and boom, there it is. You get your yeah. forbearance. Absolutely. Now, here's the challenge with that. A lot of folks are going to apply for it, um, including folks who are essential workers. And if you really need it, then okay, that's, uh, we understand that's what it's there for. That being said, the general consensus is that what will happen is month one, you'll skip your payment. Month two, you'll skip your payment. Month three, you'll skip your payment. And month four, four payments will be due. 100%. Right? And so when, uh, I mean, imagine that you're just getting back to work there's all of these things, or maybe uh, just the economy's getting started and everybody's getting out of the, you know, getting out and about once again, restaurants reopen, all of that. And then month four comes along and you've got a, or you've got a bill. So let's just say your mortgage is $2,000 a month. Okay. You owe $8,000 on month four. Now in that time frame, and the reason why I mentioned TransUnion, Equifax and Experian because those are the three major credit reporting bureaus. Yeah. Those guys, we, we've heard nothing from them on how they're going to report this. All right. So best case scenario, best case scenario, they report it as a nine on your credit report, meaning it's underneath a forbearance. Yeah. Not paid as agreed. All yeah. right. That has a large chance to prevent you from obtaining a mortgage obtaining a refinance. Uh, it could definitely impact you if you're buying a car, applying for new credit. Basically, it, it'll drag your credit score down. Worst case scenario, okay, they mark it as a late. And not only a late, but remember, because remember, you did it three months in a row, a yeah. rolling late, a 90-day late. Yeah. You could have a massive detrimental impact on your credit. So if you are having to do the forbearance, um, you know, it's, it's not something that I'm encouraging, but I'm definitely empathetic on. If you have to, then you have to, because you've been impacted by the situation. If you can at all avoid it, 
if you can all avoid it, um, please take this time um, and look and see what your other options are. Because we, the CARES Act is just so up in the air. And the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a position where you, you end up losing your credit score and you have a huge monster mortgage payment that's done because there's nothing in the CARES Act that says then at the end of the forbearance, the mortgage servicer has to rework your loan. There's no, there's no language in that act uh, that says that. So that's that could create a, a lot of different crisis for a lot of different families. And so we're trying to get the word out and make sure that everybody has that information. Correct? And, and I think just to tack on to that, that's an important conversation. And the problem, not the problem, the situation that's ar arisen from this, arose, arisen, that's on me, I don't know how to say that word, uh, that's come from this is that the CARES Act was very general. And now we have a decentralized approach on how all the banks are going to handle it. So I've seen yeah. banks say, hey, we'll take those three months and then we'll tack it on the end. And then, but like you said, I've seen banks say, yeah, we'll, you just don't pay for three months. And then you just pay four months worth of your mortgage on the fourth month. And then we don't know what the extra interest looks like, the late fees look like. And then again, what does it look like on the credit situation? So I think right. the super important thing that comes from this is you have to talk to a professional, right? Whoever it is, it doesn't have to be me, but find the person who you consult with, your loan manager, stuff like that, and then get it in writing and then get everything expelled up front, right? You don't know what you don't know, right? In, in real estate, the name of the game is always staying cash flow positive. And if you Absolutely. need it, it is a tool out there for you. But just like Sean was saying, just like you're saying, it, it like there are snakes in the grass that if you don't take the time to weed out, they're going to bite you later. And it, and we don't right. know what it looks like now. Because again, this we're, we're not even a month old with this. And right. so we have exactly. the first month cycle of what this is going to look like. And I'll tell you some of the things that I've seen is, um, you know, just being in the mortgage industry, in real estate industry, you know, I have clients who come to me and they're in a distressed situation. Perhaps somebody uh, passed away in their, you know, in their household, or there was a major medical uh, situation, loss of job. And, you know, we'll talk through options and, you know, they'll get on the phone with their servicer. I have heard in the past where the servicer will take those portion of the payments and place them on the back end. Yep. Okay. In some cases, it hurt their credit. In some cases, it didn't. 100%. Now, with that being said, just a little insight for everybody on how the mortgage market works. Let's say you have you, the consumer, where you make your mortgage payment to. And then on the backside, what nobody really talks about is there's an underlying investor along with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac who insure the loan. Mm -hmm. So it could just be a host of different companies, um, hedge fund companies, whatever. Uh, they're there. All right, so no matter what, on the first, the company that you make your mortgage payment to has to forward on a payment to that investor. That is their obligation, yep. okay? No matter what, that has to do it, whether you make that payment or not, okay? So imagine this. The general United States public is informed they don't have to make their mortgage payment, okay? There's no, like there could be some serious ramifications for those servicers because they can't make those payments to the investors. So you could see a really, really big financial crisis come out of all of this. And that's another reason why I feel like, and this is just, again, one loan officer's humble opinion, they yeah. may not be so apt to work things out yeah. with each and every person, unless they receive some major government bailout because they are on the hook. Yep, and absolutely. If for whatever reason, you know, they're having trouble making those payments to the servicer, they might look to expedite the foreclosure process because after 90 days, mm -hmm. after 90 days of delinquencies, the servicer has a right to enforce foreclosure proceedings, yep. correct? Uh, and, and again, that's the thing that I've been trying to tell people is that this isn't just a one size fits all. This is a deliberate conversation with your bank, because like you said, every servicer is held like it's their obligation to pay. 
So yep. and every servicer has a different balance sheet. So every servicer is going to be different. Everybody's going to be different in the situation. And that's why I keep telling people, ha- make informed decisions. Like you could get to the end of it and decide, okay, hey, this doesn't work out for my situation. But if you don't have all the knowledge to make the proper decision, you could be losing, right? Whether it's you take the forbearance and then you have to pay it month forward, that's a loss. Or you, you needed the forbearance and then you didn't take it. And then you missed an opportunity to alleviate some stress. Because again, this is a stressful time right now in America and right. the world. Right. And I mean, again, you might not be looking to buy or refinance a home or mm-hmm. buy a vehicle at this time, but you know, that sticks on your credit report for at least seven years. hundred yeah. um, percent. And that's going to be, again, we just be smart and that's the way you just got to go through it deliberately. Now with all of that being said, man, are there any tax implications if you participate in the forbearance program? So in the for, if you participate in the forbearance program, there's no tax implication. So that was the strange thing that came out as far as people who don't have a business, forbearance and the stimulus package, they seem to just be things, opportunities that the population could, could participate in and they wouldn't feel any impact come tax time, right? There's secondary and tertiary effects from those. But right now, if you participate in tax forbearance, you don't get any kind of credit or ding at the end of the year. Yeah. As of right now. And then for the stimulus package, obviously just say it, you, you don't pay tax on the stimulus package just as an overarching opinion. Right. Okay. Well, we got a, we actually got a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let me see. Uh, we've got Carisha again, who's just saying she thought that the payments were tacked at the end of the loan. Okay. That's, that's yeah. That's, that's a all general that. consensus, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you, you got to get in touch with your bank. You got to ask them and get it in writing, get it in writing, get it in writing. Zach was saying uh, the same, Zach Schmidt. And then also he says, so won't the majority of people have to do a forbearance most likely be set up for failure once they are required to pay? So again, just in case you heard, won't the majority of people who participate in the forbearance be set up for failure. Yeah, and that's, you have that's to talk to your bank. True. Yeah, 100%. Like, like, I'll, I'll just put it out there. I mean, yes, I mean, for the majority of folks who do participate in that, they are being set up for failure, which yeah. is why I think uh, not just myself, but I have a lot of colleagues and not just the ones that work for my company, um, just a lot of great people out there putting information that are in the mortgage and real estate industry. You yeah. know. The, I have to give the real estate agents a ton of credit for getting this message out there because they obviously don't want to see their clients who they help achieve wealth um, through the equity of their homes. They don't want to see them lose those homes. They don't want to see their credit, you know, fail. And what's happening is that for the majority of folks that are in this situation, um, yeah, they could be set up for failure. And that's, that's really, really unfortunate. Um, Let's see, there's some more. Uh, 100%. And if you don't have it in writing, it's it's just not it's not real. So like if you if you're thinking about it and they won't put it in writing, I would go away from that option with that bank. Yeah, Zach and uh Carisha just basically saying that is that's it just is one of those things where it's very factual. Like mm-hmm. you have to get those things in writing, you have to do that. So uh I, if you want, I mean, I don't know, we, we can talk about this, but I know I, I have a lot of friends on here that own businesses. And I mean, you know how the Kitsap market is and yep. in the county area, they, they own businesses and uh, self-employed. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the PPP program is? Yeah, this? sure. So along with the CARES Act, there was two more, well, two other programs that came out with it along with a bunch of others, but there's two different loans right now that business owners can go to. And so the first one is the emergency injury and disaster loan, the EIDL. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that you heard, you get a $1,000 grant up to $10,000 for every employee that you have. And then there's a bridge loan process. And then you can get a loan up to $2 million. That is not forgivable. And then you have the PPP, the paycheck, the paycheck protection program, which is a, it's essentially to protect you having employees. They don't want people to get fired. They won't want this. They're trying to stop the unemployment. So basically what that is, you take the average of your payroll over the last 10 months or 12 months, I apologize. And then you multiply that by 2.5. And then that's the, the amount of loan that you can apply for up to $10 million. That low is impressive because it is a forgivable loan. 
So those right. are the two big differences. Awesome. Awesome. Um, let's see, man. Uh, how about solutions? Let's talk about potential solutions that are out there for folks uh, as opposed to forbearance. What yeah. are your thoughts? Uh, honestly, I would just get real tight. Um, this is a time to look into, I mean, you can kind of talk to about refining more uh, like right now. Cause again, if you can refi in this process right now, it gives you, as you know, a space of roughly two ish months to where you wouldn't have to pay your mortgage. And then you may be able to par possibly participate in the lower interest rates because those are also taken now. Right. And I'll share my screen real quick, just so uh, folks can see that. So let's see my other screen right here. We'll go ahead and share. All right, let's see. Uh, you know, basically, um, home price changes in the last recession. I know that folks are hearing about recessions quite a bit. Um, 2008 was the only one that we really had 19.7, um, 19.7, uh, sorry, somebody's at the door, 19.7 dip uh, in equity as it was going. So r really, I mean, in the last couple of recessions, uh, home ownership has actually done still really, really well. There hasn't been a lot of changes when it comes to pricing. Uh, one thing I would like to definitely touch on is currently right now, 53.8% of all homes in America have at least 50% equity. 30% uh, of all homes are actually owned free and clear, which is an incredible number. Um, and then 26.7% of all homes of mortgage homes have at least 50% equity. So there's a ton of equity. Uh, Americans have more equity in their home now than at any other time in history. Also, where mortgage rates are projected to be at. Again, these are just projections. But when you're taking a look at, you know, is it more beneficial to refinance? Is it more beneficial to do a forbearance? Kind of look at your own situation. I mean, if you have an interest rate over 4% right now, you could see some serious benefit. And this report came out from Fred, uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Mortgage Bankers Association, and National Association of Realtors. We just took an average of all four of them. Uh, all of their economists really chimed in and you know, are discussing where they feel like mortgage rates are gonna be. So if you're above that 4% mark, um, this gives you an idea of what it looks like. Now, where does that look like in history? I can tell you at one point uh, over the last couple of months, I believe it was uh, the week of March 9th, interest rates got down to 3.14%. And so where you look at that is, these are the lowest rates that we've seen in over four years. So just keeping that mindset, hey, money is cheaper. We do have other options. Uh, the last thing I would share is average days to close a loan. Um, what you're looking at right now is that's estimated to be about 43 days, and that's as of February. I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> you're probably looking at one and a half times that these days. I mean, I, I've been talking to most folks, and uh, even our own company, it's like 40 to you know, 60 days on average to close a home loan. Um, I've heard other companies, the larger banks are taking 90 days. I've heard a couple of companies not taking mortgage applications anymore at this time. Um, there's gonna be some challenges. There's been a couple of big reports as far as news articles that have gone out in the last 24 hours about major financial institutions um, changing their lending guidelines. So. This is gonna happen, it's there. I'm available for questions. Larry's available for questions. Um, I'm gonna have Larry put his contact information up, uh, but just before we get going, uh, he's gonna be on with me for the next couple of weeks. We're gonna talk about some great topics, um, everything from uh, doing renovations on, hose, uh, on homes uh, to uh, if you are a real estate agent, what are some great tax benefits for yourself and uh, what are some tax benefits for your clients that you can kind of communicate and feel solid about, uh, as well as uh, just diving a little bit more into the refinancing and VA home loans, you know, uh, Larry's active duty himself. So what that looks like. And then uh, we're just going to keep trying to find ways to help you build wealth and save money. So with that being said, Larry, anything in closing? 
Um, I well, ask the big things I got hit on for everybody is um, always search, ask more people, especially with loans, shop them, documentations, everything in the tax world. Really, I feel like everywhere, but definitely in the tax world in my life, like taxmentation, like taxmentation, documentation is everything. The more that you can bring me, the more information you can give me at the end of the year, the more intelligent conversation that we can have about saving you money, which is my favorite part of the job. And then again, um, be safe, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go ahead and put uh, your contact information up. And then guys, thank you so much for tuning into this. Uh, we appreciate you and please uh, reach out to Larry with any questions, reach out to myself. Uh, but other than that, I just want to thank everybody for their time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody. All right. We'll talk to you soon, man. See you.